anybody who's been waiting. We got we got a bunch of people waiting for us. We're live oh, with wow. Mark Thompson. How you wow. doing, my friend? I'm well, thank you, sir. It's an sure. honor to be here. Uh, thank you so much. History on this platform. You know, uh, Mark has said so many nice things about me over the years, and now I can say nice things about Mark. Mark is a great guy. He's funny. He has a wonderful voice. He is a friend of me, of mine. Um, he goes back to working with my dad. Um, what I love about Mark more than anything else this all started a few years ago when his producer called and said, hey, can you come on Mark's show tomorrow and talk about one of your stories? And I said, sure, which? And he goes, all of them. And <laughs> I would go on the show and, and uh, I mean, Mark would just do one after the next, after the next. He'd, he'd read them all and it was, it was fantastic. And and he'd always laugh whenever, you know, he's got this great sense of humor. So, Thank you, Mark, for being here. Thank you for being funny. Thank you for being a friend. Uh, thank you for doing this with me. And um, hi. Well, what a lovely way to be brought on to uh, your community here. Thank you. Yeah, I. Uh, uh, well, I'm a fan as well of your of your work and also of all you've done. I mean, you've really extended a hand to us, so we could kind of make our way on this platform. It's still somewhat unclear to me all the things you need to do on YouTube. So uh, Jeff's been just great with, you know, bringing that to life for us a little bit, you know, suggesting this, suggesting that, and then actually, you know, doing it with me, like, you know, dragging me across the finish line. So really appreciate uh, your your help and uh, your friendship in that regard as well. So, yeah. Well, let's, let's start with the show because uh, you were doing KGO. I believe it was, you were the top rated, if not one of the top rated uh, shows in, in San Francisco for three years, right? It was three years you right. were doing the show, right? Yeah. And you got this great show and then they make a station format switch and you say, let's put the show online. Talk to me about that process. Well, the uh, first thing that I would say is that sadly, we didn't have any real warning of the uh, coming change. And so, because it all happened so suddenly and there was no opportunity to let the audience know anything, we've had to count on people just finding us, which has been a much, much more tedious part of all of this than I would like, we found and we've uh, seen others find us on the order of a few thousand uh, listeners. I don't know how many are KGO listeners and how many are others, but I would say, you know, there's a good chunk, thousands of people who have found us, but there are thousands of others of others who are out there as well. And because, as I say, the sudden nature of things, they just never will know that we're on YouTube, you know. They're used to listening on the radio, and that was certainly the easiest way to do it, and KGO was probably the best job I've ever had to be able to create a show like that every day. They never told me I couldn't do this, I couldn't do that. They were really cool. I got to say, KGO management was very cool, and um, the, the new... Uh, well, so we got the word, and I said, "Hey, let's take let's take it all to YouTube." So I took Kim with me, and I took John Daly, and uh, we went to YouTube, and uh, it's been an effort. It's a far, far more labor intensive effort, and and I I'll tell you, it is exhausting. Um, I don't really have anyone, you know, doing a lot of the stuff that I had at KGO. Uh, even the booking, I sort of have to do myself. It's we don't have the money to pay it as a full time thing, or even as a decent. We we pay a really good wage, actually. I, I believe in paying people, you know, good money. But uh, it's hard to have somebody who's working as a side hustle really be as obsessed with trying to make it work as I am. And so, the process of moving it from radio to YouTube has been a laborious one. And uh, there are many days I go, wow, I just, you know, I, well, let I me just ask don't you, have it. Was it yeah. worth it? Was it worth it? You're now three months, four months into it, maybe a little longer. Was it worth it? 
Uh, I mean, worth it is a very tough thing. I don't mean to evade it at all. Of course, it's worth it on some level. I'm enjoying this project. I want to do it. I wouldn't be doing it if it uh, it'd be just as easy for me to turn off the lights tomorrow if I didn't if I didn't feel like it was worth it. But the it in worth it is not where I am right now. I need to build the show bigger. I need to lean in harder. I need to um, continue uh, to improve you know i'm um i'm anxious to do all of those things and it's just so exhausting uh, well, it's really hard to do it on your own how's the show doing it's doing well i mean we just passed eleven thousand subscribers you know um i think we have almost no i think we have yeah, 11, yeah it's just, uh, just over eleven thousand. yeah yeah so uh so that's good although i'm unclear you know uh Jefferson Graham has actually been helpful to uh, us in explaining, you know, you want the 10,000 because at 10,000 you can do other things or certain um, categories, if you will, that you fall into as a 10,000 subscriber show that you wouldn't fall into if you didn't have 10,000 subscribers. So I know that it's good that these subscriptions are picking up. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, things are things are good right now. I mean, it's just uh, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, was, how's how's it going? You're doing a meetup tonight. Yeah. Are you doing that online? Are you doing it in person? What's going on? We're doing a meetup tonight. It's uh, a virtual meetup, so it's online, just like you and I are meeting right now. The idea was that we could put together. We really wanted to do a live meetup, but. It's just too hard right now, and people are scattered all over the place, and I just don't know how many people would actually be able to make that happen. It would That would really be a lot of work, and I just don't have the bandwidth right now to, to make that happen. But it will happen eventually, I hope. But uh, meantime, we thought we'd do a virtual meetup with just 15 listeners and slash viewers, and... Uh, It'll be fun. It'll be 45 minutes. It'll be myself, John Daly, who's a producer on the show, and uh, uh, Albert, who's another producer on the show, uh, Tony, who comes through. I mean, so these are all people who the audience knows a little bit. Of course, Kim will be there, who's the news person. I think it'll be a lot of fun. Courtney, my other half, who does a uh, Murder Mystery Monday, she'll be there, and she's never seen on camera, but she will be seen tonight. So... I think it's going to be fun, and it's also a capital raise, frankly. You know, we re need to raise money. Uh, we've got some challenges financially, and I'm just trying to raise a little bit of money and do it in a fun way. So this serves both those masters, and uh, I think it will be uh, enjoyable. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. All right, so I'm going to flash on the screen your Patreon, patreon.com slash The Mark Thompson Show. Please contribute, and uh, it's that's what you have to do to, to – uh, to keep a show on the air right now. You've been in broadcasting for a few decades, right? You started yeah. off working in radio. That was at the very beginning, right? Right. Okay. In fact, could, I, uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. It sounded could, like you, there was more to that question. So that's Well, the, the, qu the other part of the question is, could you imagine right. back then you'd knock on someone's door and say, put me on the air, and they'd either say yes or no. And here we are all these years later, and you now have the tools to, I'm going to put on the show myself. Right. And I'm going to do it. Right. And what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a, there's a great sort of egalitarian quality to that. But uh, it's, I'm not really happy with what's happened with the broadcast world in America. Uh, mergers have destroyed radio, in my view, and television for that matter. Um, and they're destroying themselves. They're, they're gobbling themselves up right now. But one of the reasons that we're not on KGO is because there was no local ownership. Had there been local ownership, KGO would be on the air the way it was, and we would be very successful, I think. Uh, we're owned by a conglomerate, and these conglomerates are allowed to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you end up with some conglomerate, which is not in the city, in this case, San Francisco, where KGO is. And they make decisions that are just X's and O's, and you don't really have a sales staff that's dedicated to selling your station. And so you end up getting rid of a perfectly viable format. I'll give you just, and then uh, I know I, I haven't forgotten your questions about this, this, uh, technology and what do I think of that 
But I will just give you the example of WABC in New York, which really was a KGO type station. WABC in New York was bought for a song. Same situation as KGO. We can't, we got to get rid of it. No. They sold it. Purchased by local ownership. And now it's insanely successful. Okay. KGO could have been purchased possibly by local ownership. And it too could have been insanely successful, potentially. Uh, so I'm saddened by the state of radio and television and broadcasting and media generally, which has allowed these conglomerates to make life so difficult. Now, what do I think about being able to power up your own, essentially your own setup? It's great. I mean, when I was a kid, I guess you could be a ham radio operator or something, but you know, there was no way you were actually going to be a broadcaster unless you were at a broadcast facility. And so you'd look for smaller ones, ones that would, you know, where the bar of entry was low enough that you could clear it as an inexperienced broadcaster. Uh, I started very young in, in radio and then uh, into television. Even in television, I was very young when I got in. When I was working with your dad, I might have been 25, you know. And um, it's, it's exciting to see the access so completely available for all of us. You know, everyone to, can, can do their own thing. It comes fraught with issues, but it also comes filled with potential. So I, I think it's a very exciting time. Okay, so basically all you need is a microphone, a mixer, software to go live and an internet connection and a webcam right to do what you're doing you do more that's right. but that's all you need sure sure yeah i mean you I'm, don't even need that you don't need you i mean you do need it but i'm saying you can have it all in your phone if you wanted right if you wanted it would be a little hard it, i think it looks better the way you're doing it where oh yeah i mean it looks yeah, yeah. 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 where was your first job um my first job was broadcasting, broadcasting job at WINX Radio in Washington, D.C. It was a small radio station in Washington, though. I mean, in Rockville, Maryland. So it was pretty, I mean, you're on a major market, you know, kind of situation, but you're, you're really major market adjacent because it's a smaller station. And at the same time, I was at WOHN Radio, which stands for Herndon. W O H N Herndon, Virginia. And that's right near Reston, Virginia, which is a small community that was actually built by and for Exxon employees. Anyway, huh. those two jobs during my college years, those are my first broadcasting jobs. And I was super excited to have them. It was really great. Um, okay. So, and what, what were you doing? You were a news guy. You were spinning records. I was you were a, doing what? No, I was a DJ. I was a, I was a DJ. Yeah. It was a real, um, and I was obsessed with broadcasting. I really sports is where I wanted to be. I wanted to be a play by play sports guy and I just didn't know how to do it. And I still really have the regret, um, that I never really understood how to go about working whatever. I had no contacts or anything. I've had no contacts in, in show business or in, in media, you know, so a little bit harder, but, uh, I, uh, I was just a DJ. I was a DJ on the radio, but I was uh, truly immersed in radio and radio artistry and the performance, uh, on radio. I understood it, I thought, or at least I, I inhaled 24 hours a day this medium of radio. So by the time I cracked a mic, I at least could fake what I thought a DJ sounded like. And since I like personality radio personalities, I like real per I didn't like the formulaic disc jockeys. I like the personality DJs. Those were the ones that really sort of began to inform who I was on the radio and I'm sure, you know, maybe in raw form, but you um, switched to weather at some point, right? I did. I did. I switched early to on? weather, uh, early on. I was, uh, at, in Buffalo, New York at, um, WKBW, which is a 50,000 watt clear channel station. And I was doing nights 
and we'd get calls from you get calls from Jamaica, you get calls from um, the Virgin Islands. I mean, people would listen to KB all the way down the eastern seaboard and out into the ocean. It was spectacular. It was really cool, um, and it was a rock and roll uh, pop station, and they had a TV station, and there was an a, there was a weekend weather opening, and so I auditioned with this um, camera guy who was a friend of mine, and we went out on uh, to the marina on a weekend, and he uh, just rolled some tape on me kind of doing a mock weather broadcast, and then I would have to get training in weather because I didn't know. And I had a science background in college, but aside from that. So anyway, um, he is shooting this thing. He tells me to get on this boat in this marina. Actually, go get on the boat, and then you'll walk off the boat, you'll walk down, toward the camera just to show them that you can walk and talk. So I get up on the boat and I start my, you know, uh, what a great weekend it's going to be here in Buffalo. And this woman comes up from underneath, from down below. I mean, the, the boat had looked empty, but it wasn't. There was a woman there and she came up on the deck and she said, what the hell is going on here? Who are you? Get the hell off of my boat. This is outrageous. You just go up and climb onto people's boats. She starts, you know, really reading me the riot act, which probably I deserve to have read because, you know, she was right. Um, but he's still rolling and I'm still playing it like I'm still on the air. And so then I uh, turned to the camera. I walked off the boat and I began kind of ad it and making it funny. And that apparently got me the job. So... Okay, Grace under pressure. They then uh, they then uh, put me together with a um, a tutorial program to really learn the weather part. So I learned you know how to read the numerical models and all of that stuff. So that was uh, that was really thanks to to all of them in Buffalo. Uh, uh, if you read some of the old stuff that's written about you, you were known as a dancing weatherman. Uh, to the listeners of your current show who may not be aware of this, would you like to tell them what that's all about? Uh, that's just the result of my, uh, in Los Angeles, dancing one night. I don't know. I'll try to make this a long story short. Essentially, this is part of the media merger thing. Rupert Murdoch and the Fox stations bought all the Chris Craft stations in a lot of places. Um, in San Francisco, I don't think there is a duopoly. But in Los Angeles, there's Channel 2 and Channel 9, owned by the same people. In L New York, you have the same thing. You have uh, a duopoly. In Chicago, there's a duopoly, where you have two stations owned by the same company. As I say, uh, Rupert Murdoch, very powerful group in the Fox Station group, acquired another station. I was working at the Fox Station in Los Angeles. Not the politics of Fox weren't there at all. It was just the local station owned and operated station. And so now the other station in the market that Rupert has just picked up, that is going to be an owned and operated station. So the two are merging, right? So eventually I knew this was going to happen. And they said, we want you to do the weather after you finish the 10 o'clock news on Channel 11. We want you to do the weather over on Channel 13. That show went out at 11 and didn't get done till midnight. I was not excited. So the good thing about that show was that it was more of a rock and roll show, meaning there were a lot of swooshes and spinning video and music sounders and stingers, all of which I like. And when they threw the weather... They didn't just do the, well, Mark, tell us it looks like it's going to be chilly for the weekend. Is that right? They didn't do that. They spun this thing on that said weather, and there was a stinger with the kind of music. And since I didn't want to do this to begin with, <laughs> it was really born of my own looseness and feeling like, hey, F you, I'll do this, but I'm not going to sit here and lean in with the science of it all. We're going to make it fun. So I asked the director to leave the music up. Or maybe I told him to fade it out, but then bring it back up. I forget which. And then when he did that, then I started just like 
dancing, and the anchors just couldn't believe it. They just lost it. I mean, now you see people in various markets dancing or bumping. No one did that back then. I mean, it was really like, what? What is this? In fact, it was picked up by all of these different <laughs> national newscasts. I was on Fox News Channel. Jimmy Kimmel did a thing on on it um, because what it turned into was. I brought music and I used to bring like heavy hip hop music and stuff like that so that, you know, here I am, this awkward, you know, pale white dude dancing to this, uh, dancing awkwardly to this hip hop music. And it was just funny. And so uh, it turned into a real thing. And when my rule on it, I'll just say this quickly, was as long as the weather is fairly mellow it's cool to do it, but like in intense situations, like we get Santa Ana winds, there are fires, there are floods. Uh, I didn't dance. I mean, and and when I didn't, <laughs> we'd get tons of emails saying the only reason I tune in is to watch Mark dance. How, why, why wasn't he dancing tonight? It's like, are you kidding? Seriously, dude, there are people whose homes are threatened tonight because of Santa Ana winds. That's why. I'll but just, um, I'll just say you were yeah. TikTok before TikTok, right? Yes, thank you. TikTok yeah, you were. Um, uh, I'm gonna. I know you. You're on a schedule, so I'm going to keep it going. And yeah, sorry about that. Leave yeah. in a few minutes. But um, you have all these credits, movies and TV credits on IMDb, and I don't know if some of these are the shot of the reporter waving or something. I mean, which one do you actually have like lines and stuff and and a big role? Which one of these movies or TV shows? Uh, first of all, how dare you? Uh, even suggest that I am only in a movie uh, somehow waving. Uh, or, although, to be fair to you, they did cut my lines from Air Force One, so I get these close-ups, but I never ever say anything. The uh, Probably the highest profile thing I did right when I got to Los Angeles was The American President. I did it within a few years of getting to L.A., and... Jane Jenkins is the casting director. She's a very famous casting director. And I went in with a bunch of other people. And this is in the movie with Michael Douglas, Annette Benning, Richard Dreyfus. And I'm going for this character that has a name. Now, normally, to your point, when you're going to be a media person in a movie, you don't get a character name. You're just reporter number one, anchor number two. That's usually what you are. I had a name which all of a sudden the character is sort of in a different place and she said, uh, I remember her telling me this after the audition, when I got the role she called me, she said, I've got good news, they really would like you, they want you and your character has a name and I said, oh, that's very fun. I didn't really know all the other stuff that I told you until later, it was explained to me that you know nobody has a name but then she said, and you're in a scene acting with a principal, meaning you know, you're now with the right room with Richard Dreyfus, as it turns out. So it's a pretty big deal. That was the American president. And I will remember on the day that I arrived to do the American president, I'm there. Rob Reiner is directing. Okay, so this is a really big move. So written by Aaron Sorkin, directed by Rob Reiner. Here I am, this guy who's playing the I'm playing kind of like a McLaughlin group guy, kind of a um, you know, a round table a host, political roundtable host, and I sit in the makeup chair next to Richard Dreyfus. He's right there. He's reading the paper. And I said, hi. And I kind of took a, you know, don't speak unless spoken to view. So I said, hi. He said, hello. And I'm sitting there. Nothing's happening. And then Rob Reiner comes in. And Rob Reiner didn't even acknowledge me, as I recall. But he did say to Richard Dreyfus, these words. Now you have to understand, when you're in these films, there's a really good chance you're not going to make them the cut. You know what I mean? As Jefferson Graham has just said, you know, what films were you really in? What films were you just like waving a notepad? You know what I mean? It's a fair question. I was giving him a hard time, but it's a fair question. And uh, most of the time, you have a good chance of maybe just being a notepad waver and not actually getting into the movie for these reporter anchor roles. So Reiner comes in, and he says to Richard Dreyfus this. He says, this is a critical scene in the movie. 
And after that, I have no idea what he said. I didn't give an F what he said after that. All I knew is I ain't getting cut out of this movie, mother effer. This is a critical scene. The director just said it was a critical scene. I was so excited. And it was a critical scene in the movie. So uh, that was probably the biggest movie with um, uh, where I played a reporter anchor. But the bigger, bigger movie where it, that's still running all the time and I think it's another pivotal scene in the movie, is Day After Tomorrow. I'm the weather guy in Day After Tomorrow sort of telling the world that the world is ending. So, But I did X-Files in 24, and I've done a lot of stuff. I, I really did a lot of on-camera stuff. And I did a movie called Deterrence, where I'm essentially the anchorman through the whole thing, runs through the whole a whole movie. It's... Um, it's kind of a cool film, actually. Deterrence, it's called. But anyway, and, wh um, and while you were yeah. making these movies, you were at KTTV as the weather guy, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah. And talk then doing about voiceover stuff too. So yeah, let's yeah. talk about voiceovers because you're doing voiceovers every day now, right? Or a lot. I do. You voice, do a lot of voiceovers. I do voiceovers. When, yeah, when I can. I audition most days. You know, I don't know. You don't get things all the time. Okay, so but. tell people some of the great voiceovers that you've done. Well, I mean, I've had great uh, opportunities to be on great uh, shows and do uh, work with great clients, you know, on commercials. Um, American Idol is probably the show that, you know, people know the best. Uh, I did 14 or 15 seasons of that, you know, the beginning of the show, the, um, you know, last night they sang their hearts out. Tonight, one goes home. You know, that, all, that at the beginning of Idol and also uh, throughout Idol. That was probably the highest profile show, but I did tons of, are you smarter than a fifth grader? And, uh, you know, I did tons of award shows. If, if a show had ladies and gentlemen, please welcome, then I did it. Oh. I mean, it was a, there was a period during which I was doing a lot of, you know, everything from the Emmys to the, you know, to the Billboard Music Awards. I didn't in general like live announce because of the rehearsal. Not because of, I'm not nervous about the announce. I'm nervous, uh, I'm, it's tons of rehearsal days. Like, I mean, uh, uh, rehearsal hours, I should say, usually two days. So you have to be there uh, and it just, it's not worth it. But, um, but music shows I always enjoyed because you could see the rehearsal and that was enjoyable to be there for the rehearsal. So music shows, I made an exception. I would try to Usually, if I got an offer, I would take it on music shows. Are you doing and commercials And I've seen some now? wild stuff. Yeah, are you doing commercials Am I doing commercials? Yeah. yeah, I did TurboTax. I did... Um, uh, TurboTax is the one that is probably the highest profile that ran. But I'm on I'm on NASCAR, and um, uh, I'm on uh, something right now, something else on Fox. I, I'm trying to remember but this um, is the, isn't this the dream job that everybody you know you don't have to dress up it's just you go into a studio and talk into a mic yeah there's good and bad to it i think you're right uh, or i know what you're implying it's um it's really cool to be i'm a performer so i like the performance aspect of voiceover that every voiceover is different that you know there is there are different dialects you can do, or you, there are different uh, pitches. The way you're, you're in pitching your voice, there's different levels of excitement and emotion, and you can warm up a read. You can make a read more intense and edgy. Um, these are all performance related things. Those are the things I like. You don't just go into a booth and read the stuff in this voice. Although it might be this voice, but the copy might demand a certain level of performance or pacing or something. So I like the performance part of it. The going into the booth part, like, isn't it cool how you go in and, you know, in a half hour you've made blank? Yeah, but it takes so much work to get to that part. Casey Kasem had a great line because he was a big voiceover guy. And Casey Kasem said that someone asked him, because he was on Pepsi, I think, you know, uh, Pepsi, the choice of a new generation or whatever, you know, uh, Casey said, he said, just a one line. And somebody came up to him and said, how long did it, did it take you? Uh, he said, they, they asked him, what'd you get for that? And he said, I don't know. Got like 150,000. He said, why is it? Wow. That's really great. How long did it take you to make that? And he said, 22 years, <laughs> you know, it, 
you gotta you gotta push the rock up the hill a lot before you get to ah just pop into a studio read a member of FDIC and then I go collect a check for three thousand dollars you know what I mean it's, it's it's there's a lot more to it than that okay Let, let's keep with uh, the uh, the iPhone angle that I love in that you're using the iPhone to do auditions to to record your voiceovers how are you doing this with the iPhone. Well, it's not optimal and it's not super desirable, but I have gotten jobs just recording off of the voice memo in the iPhone. I have, you know, I've auditioned when I'm on the road or something. I may not have my rig with me. Usually the rig is pretty easy and I can usually record something, but the iPhone, and I'll say to the agent, all I have is the iPhone. Can I just, and they'll say, just do an iPhone audition. And so I do, and I've gotten a couple of jobs that way. The iPhone is not bad. Okay. And what is your normal rig? Do you go out with a Zoom recorder or something like that? I go out with a, there's a mic that um, I have. Uh, you would know this stuff better than I do. I don't know the technical stuff. Um, you get a microphone and it plugs into something, right? Yeah. Plugs into the computer. Okay. Yeah. And then, yeah. uh, and you can build up, you just build a file and then you edit the file and send it. Yeah. Okay. So I have a v rudimentary understanding of how to do it, but it, 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 se it seems to work. Okay, I know you've got to go, and I could do this for the next five hours because you are one of the most fascinating people in the world. Let's just end. <laughs> Yvonne, Yvonne wants well, to I know. Well, I like they were ending with some hyperbole, so yeah. No, no, I really, I really do. I mean, you are, you are such a storyteller, and you're amazing. And Yvonne wants to know how you met my dad. So let's just go family stuff oh, here. Oh, absolutely. You, you, that you is work? worth staying a little, a little later for. Okay. Um, I love Jerry Graham. Jerry Graham was that dude who, first of all, he had that aspect of being happy all the time, which is, uh, I envy. And I don't my know whether he was my happy grandfather's, all the time. My grandfather's yeah. motto, smile while you're sleeping, laugh while you're awake. And that's Jerry Graham's father. That's terrific. I, I, he lived it, man. He lived it. And he was uh, also, as I recall, tan all the time or tan a lot like because he was outdoors a lot doing and even his show bay area backroads was an outdoor type show and he was just super positive and friendly and lovely and you know i didn't hang out with him but i didn't uh we we talked we hung out like when he he's in the newsroom in a cron we talked but i'm saying like we didn't get together there was a gulf in age obviously probably want to be around people his own age but he was uh, i had immense respect for him and i loved his show bay area Bracco. it's a great idea and he worked with another guy who i also liked this guy bob klein and um i i just uh i have to say when when jefferson graham came on our show for me, it was a weird, a cool thing that you know, I felt like I was, you know, in a weird universe way, uh, connected to Jerry Graham, who I like so much. So uh, it really has been in this odd, eerie way, a cool way to stay connected to your father. All right. And you were doing weather while he was doing the travel show right. and, uh, and doing right. the newscast. He did the weekend news. Also, yeah, I didn't know that. I, I don't remember him doing the weekend news, but he probably did. And by the time I got there, um, I don't remember who I because I started on the weekend newscast, so uh, it was uh, Jim just Tamar. A, just imagine Tamar, you're, you're, yeah. you're 19 or 20 years old and you walk into Imperial Capwell and you go to the TV department, and there's your father on 50 television sets. Uh, doing the weekend news yeah how great is that yeah yeah i mean and he's really good like jerry graham was one of those remarkably versatile talents i have no doubt he was a great anchor you know and he was he's great as the friendly like magazine show host and he's i mean he just had it you know he's one of those guys who was a ninja and he, and he uh and as i say and in real life great dude you know he wasn't some uh you know Cigar chomping guy, oh, yeah, kid, yeah, good luck. You know, he wasn't like that. He was totally the opposite, and he he kind of had a '60s hate quality to him, but but in a less stoner way, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, I don't think I don't believe he smoked cigars. Yeah, he d he did. Did your, get, did your dad get high? Yes, he, he did. must have. Yes, he had did. to. He was a, he was a rock and roll DJ for a while, wasn't he? 
Um, well, he owned a radio station. So he owned a radio station in Pittsfield, Massachusetts, that was a rock and roll station, and he was the you know obviously the station manager. He did a shift. He played some records. He did news. He did editorials. Did a whole bunch of things, and was fighting to keep the place afloat. I did a you shift know, there as uh, well. Yeah, Pittsfield, Massachusetts, is where I went to ski Brody Mountain. Okay. Yeah. Gee, I don't know. Maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but there was I, a place was called a, Brody Mountain. Was, wasn't that in Vermont? Or nearby? I thought it was called Brody, Pittsfield. No, it sounds Pittsfield, familiar. But I, I definitely skied in Pittsfield. I thought it was Brody, but maybe it wasn't. Um, those small stations are wild. Like that small station in uh, outside of Washington, uh, WOHN in Herndon, Virginia. I'll tell you the story quickly, and then I'll I'll, I'll jump. But uh, one day I'm doing the after I'm doing afternoon drive <laughs> afternoon drive. It's a small station, but. Um, and are playing, you know, rock and roll records or whatever, pop records. And the receptionist comes in. And she says, Mark, you've got to go on the air right away. Two men have just come and they've stolen my car from the parking lot. I said, wow, this is... I said, well, okay, write down what kind of car it is and let me give me, give me the list. She said, I've got it all right here. Please. And I said, okay, I'll, as soon as this record ends, I'll... Uh, I'll... So this record ends... And I say, uh, we've got this uh, sort of wild situation here at WOHN. Our uh, receptionist, uh, Sandy, uh, had her car stolen right out of our lot. So if you've seen, you know, this brown Toyota, uh, four-door, the license plate is, and I gave the license plate, please alert the authorities and be aware that that's a stolen vehicle, stolen out of our lot. So I'm first thinking, first of all, I don't think anybody's listening. <laughs> Secondly, I'm thinking, I don't know. You know, I've done what I can. I don't think that much is going to come from this. Mm, five minutes go by and we get a call. And they've been apprehended because uh, they heard my announcement on the radio. Except there's one key point. The car wasn't stolen. It was repossessed. Oh, okay. Awkward explanation for me on the air and for Sandy. So the uh, moral of the story is get all the facts before you blast onto the air and uh, and create you know, a local disturbance, which is what was created when the two guys were pulled over by our listeners. So it's tough that was the, that's the Pittsfield, Massachusetts equivalent, which is where mm -hmm. I was working, WOHN, in suburban uh, Maryland, suburban uh, Virginia. Uh, this field was, was 50,000 people at the time. I don't know what wow. it is today, but that's what it was. Mark, wow. thank you. I know you've got to go. You've got a lot of stuff going on. I want to remind everybody to go to your Patreon and patreon.com slash the Mark Thompson show. Please become a patron. Please subscribe. Please uh, send in your, your monthly donation. Don't forget Mark Thompson show every day on YouTube, Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. to 12. It's youtube.com you. slash the hey. Mark Thompson show. Let's keep Brody the show Mountain going. Brody Mountain is in Massachusetts, everybody. Come on. Thank you. I, oh, uh, I love that. He brings his applause to, uh, to I do. To my well, show. I have to. I have to enter and, and exit uh, with applause. Uh, Jeff, thanks for all your help on an ongoing basis with my, you know, my show and our platform. I appreciate it. And great to, uh, hang out with your audience today. So, all right. I'll see well. you later. Thanks again, Mark. Bye-bye. Okay. Mark is gone. Uh, Roy just has a question. Uh, I think the complete session is saved on YouTube. Is that correct? It sure is. And I want to remind everybody, we're going to come back tomorrow at four o'clock Pacific time. Uh, Friday afternoon, we're going to do the 10 hidden camera features on the iPhone that you need to know about. And there's a lot of them. Uh, I had fun putting this list together. Doc Rock from Ecamm is going to be joining us. 
and uh, we're going to be going over them uh, for tomorrow. I, I wanted to try a different time slot as well to just see how it goes there uh, because, uh, you know, we've been doing Thursdays at 2, and that's great. How would, how would we do it Friday at, at 4? Um, and, of course, there's no good time slot because Friday at 4 is 1 o'clock somewhere or 7 o'clock somewhere else. It's a different – it's a, a day ahead of time in Australia and Japan. Uh, while we're still here, do any, does anybody have any um, – any thoughts on their their preferred time slot? Do you prefer Friday afternoon to Thursday? Do you prefer Thursday or Friday? What are your thoughts? Love to hear from you. Uh, all you got to do is just click a button. I forgot to ask everybody to smash the like button, uh, like a boss. And um, if you found me on Patreon, I am actually there. And if you want to hit Super Chat and uh, click, click one of those buttons, that's cool too. Let me know your thoughts on time slots while we're still here together which is Thursday or Friday. Um, again, 10 of the best hidden features in the iPhone camera menu. That's coming up tomorrow. And uh, 4 o'clock Pacific time, I hope you'll join us. Uh, I'm Jefferson Graham. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. And uh, since there's a guitar behind me, why not pick it up? Is it in tune? <laughs> Thank you, Siri. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I will see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.